obviously, um, I I reached out to you because I was in huge need of trying to find someone to support my patients from a male fertility perspective. So um, you are the scientific director, from my understanding, scientific director of XY Fertility in Leicester. Leicester. And um, you are, you've also done a PhD in ICSI, is that right? That's right, Kimberly. Yes. So um, I, I had a career as an embryologist, a clinical embryologist. Um, so I've got a BSc and a master's. Um, and then I was working in Leicester and actually made the clinic redundant at the time. They put, put redundancy in for a lot of the hospital staff. So I went to the Nottingham University and said, I've got this redundancy package. Can I have a PhD kind of thing? Well, a bit more than that. Sure. And so they allowed me to read <laughs> for it. So I self-funded the PhD and I was working with them. Um, the Professor Keith Campbell, who, who actually cloned Dolly the sheep. Um, so I was oh, surrounded wow. by all these guys cloning, all vets. I was the only non-vet. And I was working on ICSI, so that's intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So I was looking at male factor infertility um, in the animal model. And then, yeah, it was, it was a good time. Uh, so it took me about seven years, and I would work at the Nottingham University. Then I would travel down to Coventry, where I got a part-time job, uh, and do the human ICSI, which was really quick because I was... Wow. Uh, no hand, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good fun, good signs. Mm, fantastic. And you're relatively au fait, aren't you, with Sheffield as well? So you've got a, a little connection there. Oh, absolutely. I did my two degrees, my first two degrees there. So I know Sheffield, I uh, uh, love Sheffield, wish I could live there now. Uh, you know, <laughs> no, uh, fantastic city, really love Sheffield. Um, so yeah, I lived in Broomhill and then um, Nether Edge. I actually lived by the, I trained at the facility centre there. Um, mm. I think it's their care facility. Um, so trained in the Netherage Centre um, and yeah yeah brilliant really great memories and love going back there and I'll actually be going through there on Sunday because we have the British Fertility Society meeting uh, executive committee meeting in Manchester on Monday um, so if that's the excuse to go via Sheffield then I will <laughs> oh well feel free to swing by and say hello so I'm yes, obviously more than happy to welcome you into clinic and show you around Cool. That'd be just great. see how it all kind of works and stuff um so it's great to have you here obviously just having a chat one of the reasons I said I really wanted to speak with you because I preach about um the level of support that people like yourself provide and the importance of male fertility when it comes to the whole fertility process um and I just wanted um to be able to have my patients tap into your area and of expertise and better understand why it's so important to look at male fertility factors in fertility. And from my experience and my patient's experience, it seems to be an area that seems to be quite overlooked when um, during the diagnostics and stuff. So it would be great to hear your perspective as to why that might be. Yeah, well, I fully agree with you. Um, often when, when a couple go for a fertility investigation, the guy will do a sperm test and, and that is it. And then he sits in the corner and the consultant will, will talk to the female because, right, we're going to give these drugs, the ovulation, blah, blah, blah. And, and actually, a baby is 50%. It's 50% coming from the male, 50% coming from the egg. Yes, certainly with, with IVF or something, then you do have to have fertility drugs for the female. But let's not neglect the guy. The guy is a very important part. The male factor is so important. And also, if there is a male factor, he's thinking, well, actually, this is this is you know, partially my fault. And so let's involve him in the whole process. And that's what we do down here. Mm -hmm. that's, I find it so interesting because, again, it's quite a unique thing. We don't hear a great deal about it. Um, you know, when people initially go to their GP and they're like, oh, you know, let's test the woman and let's poke and prod her to an inch of her life. Um, we'll do a single semen analysis, and then that's that's kind of it for the for the man. Um, is there just out of interest as well, just for clarity, is there any benefit of doing more than one semen analysis? Is there any reason why only one is done um, in the fertility process? Uh, lack of resources is, is probably the reason. Uh, ideally, you do too, um, because you. Sperm can fluctuate. We have sperm donors here and, and we see, I mean, I actually had one recently. He comes in great. And then he came in and he was like, well below all of the limits that we have. And it's like, what's going on? And, and oh, I'm not feeling great. You know, I've had a couple of rough days. 
And it's like, really? And then he came back in this week and he was brilliant again. So sperm could fluctuate for anyone, even, even the really fertile guys. Um, so two, two is best, really, because mm -hmm. then you can you can check that out. But I think it's lack of resources. There is so much resources, certainly, that the NHS will will put into fertility. And fertility is way down the pecking order. Of, sure. You've got cancer, you've got heart disease, etc. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna they're gonna put it down at the bottom. However, if you do the economic analysis, fertility should really be at the top because you're creating the next generation. And, and from an economical perspective, you know, you want to get more people in, into the UK. Mm -hmm. So from, from families. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, do you find then, uh, what would be your recommendation from a price? Because obviously we know that the NHS is struggling with resources, funding, whatever. Um, but from a private perspective, then, if you had a guy come in and say, you know, his semen analysis was lower than usual, um, at that point, would you say there's not great deal to worry about or would you suggest then any further testing further diagnostics to better understand what was going on well the first thing i'd do is we sit there and we look at his lifestyle uh, see if there's any changes he can make that can have a, a positive impact pretty soon so um is the guy drinking a lot is he smoking uh it has is he obese because we know that obesity is linked to male fertility so could he diet could he exercise more etc um is he having a hot bath every day um, it, it's amazing that these guys that sit there in a, in a tub of water that's that's hotter than 37 degrees C, and mm -hmm. that is going to affect their sperm production or their sperm quality. So temperature, lifestyle, all these sorts of things, we talk about that, um, and then we try to make recommendations to see if we can improve it, because sometimes it's little things like that that can actually make the difference, mm -hmm. um, and you will be surprised at how, difference, how, how much of a difference it can make. Um, and often we ask about things like drugs as well. Um, are you on anabolic steroids? We see quite a few guys on anabolic steroids. They mm -hmm. come in, they're the size of that door. Um, but that's because they're, they're taking exogenous testosterone. And so their body's going, well, I don't need to make it. So their testes reduce in size. And then if they come off the anabolics, usually a few months later, their sperm's back up to, to normal parameters. Would so it's lots of things we can do that. Would you say in that instance then it is just a few months and is that because of the life cycle of the sperm itself renewing regenerating yeah so so sperm takes three months on average to, to be produced so if you can make a change then you're not really going to see anything till three months later mm -hmm. so it, it is a lifestyle change really um so we say to guys you know come back after three or four months um and, you know, we often see um, doctors prescribing supplements. Now, supplements may, but they also may not help. Mm -hmm. If you've got a healthy diet, then in theory, you should be getting all the nutrients anyway. But there are a lot of supplements out there. Um, and if you want to see if the supplement is giving having an effect three or four months later, and three or four months later from stopping drinking, stopping having a, a spliff, stopping, you know, um, bad diet basically and this is on the subject of lifestyle because you raise an interesting um topic about um overheating should we say um mm. and it's quite a controversial subject with cycling because there's there seems to be research for research against um with overheating of testes um do you have any with your scientific and research background do you have any insight on that uh, we, we do say to guys, you know, perhaps reduce your cycling, you know, what during the period of, of trying to conceive. Uh, let's think about it. Um, you're putting tight pants on with padding to protect your testicles against the saddle. So we know you're going to be heating up the area. Now, if you're going cycling once, once a week, fine, no worries. But if you're going cycling every day and, and then at the weekend you're going out on 10 hour cycles, mm -hmm. those guys are going to be hot for quite a long time. Um, also, you're going to be abrasing your, your testes against the saddle, which, you know, um, may may affect things. Um, I've got one patient here and he says, you know, you told me to like reduce the cycling. I said, yeah, he says, well, now I cycle without touching the saddle and I wear loose shorts. And so he does all this standing up. Cycling. Oh, wow. <laughs> he, the thing is, he's losing weight, which is really good. His BMI is reducing. He's a he's a happier person mm. and he reckons like it, it, it's good for his fertility. Now, we hope so. But you know, let's see. But you know, uh, so we we do say to cut down the cycling if if you can. But again, it's a 
if they want to cycle, they want to cycle. We we offer advice. It's up to the chap what he wants to do. Sure. Um, do you notice any um correlation then between male fertility and unexplained miscarriage? <clears throat> uh miscarriage can be caused by many factors. Um there is a school of thought that DNA fragmentation uh, in the sperm may be a factor. Mm -hmm. um, so we do offer that testing, DNA fragmentation testing. Now, it is a little bit controversial because some people say absolute poppycock, it's got nothing to do with it. But we do it and we do find that you can have a chap with really good sperm, so great concentration, great motility, uh, great morphology. Um, but then when you do the DNA fragmentation test, if it does come back with a really high fragmentation level, which we can't see down the microscope, mm. um, then we, we could say, well, potentially that is, that's your DNA. And the DNA is, is the chromatin that goes into making the genetic material of the embryo. You can get fertilization, you can get the two cell four, cell eight cell embryo, you can get an implanting embryo, but if there's something wrong with the chromosomes, it most likely will miscarry at some mm. point. So, you know, there could be something in that certainly. So when it comes to ICSI then, just so I can better understand, because I get a lot of patients come back and their consultants say, that again, not specialists in male fertility, so fine, but um, that say, well, doesn't matter that your sperm sample is suboptimal because it will just do ICSI. Is yeah. there validity in that? Or, you know, should men really work on the diagnostic element and the, you know, trying to optimize their health pre-ICSI or does ICSI in your opinion just solve everything? ICSI in the opinion of many uh, fertility specialists <laughs> uh, could solve could solve everything uh, well when it comes to fertilization. Um, put it this way ICSI is carried out for non-male factor infertility throughout the world. Um, the majority of IVF taking place in the world today is ICSI. Um, ICSI is a guarantee that the sperm gets into the oocyte, the egg, mm. um, because we, we put it carefully inside the cytoplasm of the egg. Now, the risk you have with normal conventional IVF is that you put the sperm with the egg and then the next day, if the egg hasn't fertilized, you don't know, did the egg actually not get into the, did the sperm not get into the egg or was it a fact that the sperm got in and, and didn't continue? Mm. Whereas with ICSI, you know, the sperm is in the egg, absolutely. However, when you look at the figures, conventional IVF, if you've got normal sperm parameters, will give you a higher life birth rate at the end of the day. Okay, okay? that's right. Uh, and I've, I've given this argument several times uh, with uh, with my colleagues. I was on IVF Worldwide. That's a, that's a free um, academic uh, conference. And I was uh, arguing this with a professor, Professor Jovic from... Perth in Australia, where they do primarily ICSI for everybody. Mm. And I was like, I was giving the figures as to why I figure that you should try. Um, so I'm always in favor of Sorry, I've just lost you a bit. I'm not sure if it's my signal. It might be mine, so I've got rubbish into that. <laughs> <laughs> but um that's really really interesting why do you think then is it just a um is it just a consultant's preference do you think um it, it it's um it's up to the how, how the management of the team is really um but i do know there's quite a few clinics um, that will just do 100% ICSI, um, regardless of the sperm factor. And, and if that is the case, then why should they do further sperm analyses? Because they're just going to, it's like banging a nail into a bit. With, we've got the ICSI, let's bang it in. But my approach is, let's try and improve the sperm and let's try and get a more natural approach, a way to do fertilization. Because evolution has put these cells around the egg, called cumulus cells, and they select out the, the not so good sperm and they allow through the good sperm. So if evolution has done this, let, let's go with evolution. And again, the shell of the egg will not let some sperm in, but will let the good sperm in. Mm. So I prefer to try to help the guy improve his sperm quality and then do conventional IVF or more natural fertilization. Yeah, really interesting. I love your approach, how um, you work on that preconception phase. Um, 
as being a really integral pivotal point um, in the fertility journey, not just treatment. No, absolutely. No, I mean, let, let's let's try and help holistically rather than you know just just let's let's fix it because I mean yeah we can fix it like that but and also the other thing with ICSI is is you're putting out a needle in I mean ICSI works we know ICSI works but you are putting out a needle into an egg and you're you're actually suck a uh, aspiring part of the cytoplasm of the egg to allow the sperm to go in now do you think the egg wants that <laughs> you know probably not <laughs> so um if you could do it more naturally let's try more naturally. Yeah, good. Fantastic. So, you know, it's something I looked at, um, again, relating to this more holistic approach, something I saw on your website as well is that you, um, you've you got a programme, don't you, for uh, women of a higher BMI? Oh, I fit for fertility. Yes. Yeah. yeah no, no, again, this is this is a tricky one because... Um, the, the NHS, usually the BMI limit is um, 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the NICE guideline uh, says we can go up to 35, um, but we can't go above. And, and I see women who have a BMI of, say, 36, really good regular cycles. They're testing for ovulation, they're ovulating. But we wouldn't offer them treatment because we'd con we would be contrary to the UK guideline. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I kind of fight the good fight. I mean, at the moment, NICE are reconsidering their guideline. Okay, so wow. Maybe in, maybe in the future, they may change it. But we have to weigh up the risks to, to the mum and the risks to the child, etc. Mm -hmm. So the NICE guideline is there for a reason. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly, we. I mean, you must have seen women with a much higher BMI go out and get pregnant and they're smoking mm -hmm. and they're drinking. And it just it's just frustrating for the couples that can't conceive to see that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we have a fit for fertility group. Um, uh, we, we try to help people and encourage them to lose weight, but saying lose weight is a very easy thing to say. Mm -hmm. So we just try to support where we can. And does that then apply to both men and women? Because again, I don't feel like there is a great level of um, contemplation during the fertility process for how... Um, male how male health is how the male partner's health is you know their bmi is never a parameter for being able to receive treatment and yet if that is if male factor is based on as like weight as well if there is an element of how their sperm quality is in in the fertility process too should that not be part of those parameters as well and those recommendations about absolutely yeah um no we, we we want to see the guy have a have a normal bmi and um, when we say normal 20 to 25 ideally um so when i talk to couples i'm, I'm not just saying to the, if they're both like a little bit large i'm not just saying to the female you must lose the weight you you, you both must lose the weight because mm -hmm. there's so many studies that show that obesity is linked to lower sperm quality mm -hmm. so if you can reduce the obesity your sperm quality might improve so it's, it's kind of a no-brainer, really. Um, but as I say, easy to recommend they do it, but doing it, I know how hard it is. Yeah, for sure. And it looks like as well your um, council have um, some stuff in place, which is quite innovative. <laughs> it's quite yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the Leicestershire is really good at that. So they have a, they have a free, and it's actually a one-to-one. -one. It's a bespoke service. Wow. Um, to help people lose weight it's not just for fertility it's just generally because obesity is linked to so many problems um so they offer this uh service uh, yeah fantastic that is it, uh, if you could put a link in the video that'd be great yeah, no, absolutely. it's only for leicestershire people but yeah. i don't know um, south yorkshire has anything or no no there's sheffield city council um don't quite hit the mark on on those innovative <laughs> ways of thinking <laughs> i don't know if you experienced that whilst you were here but yeah um we'll see we'll see how things can change um so you know everything that you're saying is fantastic and it's really insightful and again just reinforces this um need i think for men to reach out for further support when they're struggling with trying to conceive um do you typically are the are the couples that you see in clinic then typically those people that have unexplained infertility or recurrent miscarriage or what's your typical we we see we see the whole spectrum so you okay. see the guys the couples that have been trying and then they've never had a semen analysis and then they'll come back and they'll be azospermic there'll be no sperm there um 
go ahead i was i was just curious about what you said just then um why is it that because again i have a number of patients that come in and i'm treating the the female partner and they've had three four five miscarriages but no sperm sample has ever been done Okay, well, that's because uh, I, I'm guessing because if they've got miscarriages, then they're fertilizing the eggs. So one assumes that the, they won't be able to sperm it, that there will be sperm there. Um, but when you have recurrent miscarriage, they don't tend to do semen analyses because, as I say, you, you've caused the conception repeatedly. But you could look at sperm DNA fragmentation as a test. You could also look at oxidative stress testing as a test of mm -hmm. the semen because there are, there are papers out there that show that this could be linked to miscarriage. So everyone says, oh, the female, the female, the female, but the DNA comes from the female and it comes from the male. So let's just rule out the male side of it. You know, mm -hmm. It's a joint thing. Could you um, just briefly explain what oxidative, oxidative stress test is and why it's relevant? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so. Um, you, you have free radicals in, in seminal plasma anyway, um, and that's perfectly natural, but sometimes you get higher levels of this. And when you have higher levels of um, free radicals in the semen, that can affect the sperm quality, it can affect the DNA. So if you like an indirect way of looking at how the sperm quality is beyond the standard parameters of concentration, motility, mm -hmm. um, and morphology. So if you have a very high level of oxidative stress, then that can impact on one, the ability to fertilize, and two, the ability to fertilize and cause a conception that will be a life birth. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that make sense? It's, it does. It's a, bit, it's a bit tricky. Um, so we we have the machine upstairs that, that does the testing, and we can give results the same day for that. Uh, and we can use the same sample as well. So what we often find is guys come for a detailed semen analysis, um, oxidative stress testing, and DNA fragmentation testing. You can use the whole sample. We'll give you the results of the sperm test on the day, the results of the oxidative stress test on the day, but the DNA fragmentation test, we have to snap freeze it in nitrogen. We send it to London. It then goes to the US. So it takes about two to three weeks for that report. That's what I really love about what you specifically provide is this whole, well, holistic and very rounded um, service when it comes to diagnostics and treatment and support for, for patients. Um, but that you do everything so efficiently as well. So, you know, this whole waiting game is, because people get so frustrated, you know, as age is ticking on and then they get worried and fearful about that. Um, you're like, let's get it done, crack on, blah, blah, which I think. Well, the guys, the guys, I mean, you know, the NHS is, is suffering still from the COVID backlog, et cetera. But I had a chap today and he, he did his sample in July. Um, and he's still not had the results and what we're, we're midway through of October. Now, I, you know, I appreciate that, you know, there's a lot of stress on the NHS, a lot of pressure, um, but that's in a way one of the reasons why I set this up. Let's give the guy the results the same day and, and then they've got, they're informed, they can, they can decide what they want to do. Um, and I've worked in like the field for 30 years, so I've seen how, how to try to optimise the service for gentlemen. Mm. No, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. I think you're doing a great job doing everything that you're doing. So thank you for... Well, the reviews are good so far, so hopefully we're doing something. <laughs> good. Can I just ask a final question? Just and this is a bit of a, a, um, a curveball, but something that keeps cropping up as I talk a lot with my patients about endocrine disruptors and toxins and, you know, as you're talking like free radicals and how that can um, impact um, you on a cellular level. Um is that the reason why, and I don't know, I don't think all trusts do it, but it's all clinics do it, but is that the reason why embryologists or lab staff and patients can't or shouldn't wear fragrance products during trans on transfer day? Okay, that's VOCs. That, that's that's a volatile organic compounds. Mm -hmm. So um it's it's primarily for embryos. Um so Oocytes and embryos are very vulnerable to these volatile organic compounds that are in the air. Mm -hmm. And if you go in there with your lovely aftershave on or your lovely perfume on, that chemical is then in the air and, and it will or could affect the embryo quality. Mm -hmm. And it could lead to detrimental effects on the embryo quality. So certainly for staff, we absolutely don't have any perfume or, or aftershave at all. Um, 
makeup of embryology staff is a controversial one um, because uh, my my idea would be like you, you wear no makeup because makeup you can you can bits can come off etc mm. um, but some can wear minimal makeup if they absolutely need to um, and it's like with the um, with the snood we if you've got a beard you have like a, a snood you should wear a hat I we I mean like look my lovely haircut I wear a hat <laughs> but you know uh, and, and we wear gloves we we are we treat the embryos with such respect and then. If you go in there and there's you go for the embryo transfer room and there's like the smell of Armani or whatever, and you know, no, we're gonna have to delay and then like get the air changed. Um, so there's so much effort we go into to keeping the embryos as optimal as we can. Uh, we don't have perfume, so that's the reason for aftershave. Yeah, it's it's really, really interesting um why you'd why you do that and how you do it um do you think it's like painting as well by the way painting if you, you we can't paint when we're doing treatment in the hospital or the clinic because it, it's the same thing you've got you've got vocs coming off from the paint mm. so, so, <laughs> so interesting um do you think or do you know of any research or evidence then that would indicate how those types of things exposed to say on a day-to-day -day basis so for people that are in occupational hazards you know like painters decorators or workmen or whatever how being exposed to that on a day-to-day -day basis would impact sperm quality okay that's slightly different um but th that they are where they will be inhaling toxins and and any toxins are, are going to be detrimental to the body um <laughs> Yes, uh, it, it can be paint, it can be carpet fitters with, with the adhesives. You get a lot of um, toxins in that. Um, there was a, a big study on DDT, the, um, is it DDT? The, the pest control, the um, pesticide. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was in South Africa, and I think, was it in the north somewhere? In, but we'll go with the one in South Africa. And the sperm quality plummeted. Right, and and these guys are spraying DDT all the time, um, but the, the ones that were getting pregnant, there were problems in the children. There was a higher miscarriage rate. It's because you you came back to like this toxin in the air, and it's getting into their systems, and it's affecting you know all of the cells in a way, and certainly the sperm. Mm. So if you are exposing yourself to toxins, then that can can potentially affect your sperm. So you just want to avoid it as much as you can. So it's so interesting because it's so there's so yeah it's so complex there's so much to think about um yeah it's about education at the end of the day which is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this so people could be a lot more educated about how they can gain support also what it impacts them how it affects them so there's so much information out there it's nice to just rifle through the riffraff and get some clarity on on these things absolutely I mean as I say again that's why I set up this clinic X and Y facility because um let's give them the facts and let's not muck around and, and, and be honest with them and, and try and get them on the path to conception safely as soon as possible. So how can, so obviously I refer my patients on to you, you know, I send to you an email and, you know, we do it that way. Um, if any of my patients listen to this or anyone outside of my patient kind of arena listen to this and wanted to get in touch with you and wanted the support of XY Fertility, how would they go about doing that? Uh, just send an email. <laughs> I mean, you can check out the website, um, xyfertility.co.uk, um, or, or just drop me an email, um, brian, B-O-Y-A-N, at xyfertility.co.uk, or you can phone. I mean, the number will be on the, on the website. But no, I mean, we're, we're pretty good at getting back to patients. Um, we'll get, usually we pick up the phone that day and we get back to you within 24 hours. Um, so that, that's the simplest way. Give us a Google and see if we can help. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate you going through everything again. It's been so insightful just getting some clarity on those points. And I know my patients are going to feel so supported by it. So thank you again for just taking no time. Oh, we'll, we'll do what we can to help you and I together. We'll hopefully uh, help people conceive sooner. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, is there anything else you kind of wanted to add prior to us signing off or logging off? Um, well, just just from a, the point of view of what you do, because you, you have the holistic approach to everything, mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm, I'm a big believer in that. So I, I think there is a real role for that, um, not just for the female side. Again, I think the majority of people that do turn to holistic support for fertility are female, but but guys can can seek support as well. And 
even if it's just for the stress factor, the anxiety factor, and they'll go, oh, I'm not stressed, I'm not stressed. Yeah, so back in the back of your mind, there was a little bit yeah. of stress going on. Mm-hmm. So that can help. Um, so acupuncture, reflexology, et cetera. The, the holistic approach, I'm a big believer in it. And I think what you do has has a big support for, for couples. So so oh. thanks for doing it. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. And just like, you know, as you said, with the added support for um, patients, um, the male fertility patients, just like Ian's doing. I mean, he's doing a great campaign um, for supporting men in their fertility journey. Um, so, yeah, it's it's breaking down the taboos about speaking about these things as well. I, I don't think men like to really necessarily talk about it. So it's nice to know there are support things out there. I think, uh, I don't know if you saw the programme with Rod Gilbert a couple mm-hmm. of years ago, um, and I don't know if we could put a link into this this yeah. chat about that, um, but he was talking about how he had a sperm problem and couldn't find an andrologist. And I'm looking at the screen going, I'm an andrologist, <laughs> but maybe I don't advertise enough. But um, yeah, so it's about raising awareness that there is help for male factor fertility. So Rod Gilbert, you know, the comedian's doing it, um, Ian Stones and Toby Trice. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they support the Him Fertility Charity, which is um, uh, a subsection of the Fertility Network UK charity. And I actually went to support those guys. They were doing a racetrack day at Donington, which is close to, to Leicester, because um, Toby Trice is a racing driver. Who'd have thought? So, um, and he was giving hot laps around the, uh, around the track, uh, which was amazing. But there's that side of it. There's also the fact that we're then in the hangar and we're talking about male fertility. And, and guys can actually talk about it with other guys. You're not embarrassed. You're getting support and you, you're getting told about options. Yeah. And, and that, again, it's breaking down that taboo. Yeah, it's yeah, it's incredible. And hopefully the more folk like you and Ian and I try and do my bit, but mostly you guys um, to just Join talk about it. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? I'm, I'm saying it's a joint approach. We, yeah. we need people like you and, you know, we, we work as a team to help everyone. So Yeah, that's it. Hopefully it just breaks down those barriers and allows people to speak more openly about it and get the support that they need. I think that's really important at the minute. So yeah. thank you. And do, do, you, do you get involved in November, Kimberly? No, I don't. I don't, should I? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you can't grow a moustache. Like, so I can't. I've, been a, I've been a team captain for the last 13 years for the Reproductive Scientists November group. Oh, really? Um, and over the past couple of years, we let it, we're involving the female uh, embryologists um, and, and anybody who wants to join in. Okay. You have to run 60K over the month of November. Okay. okay? And if you think you can do that, join our team. Uh, we raised seven thousand pounds last year for the November Foundation. That's amazing, absolutely. And, and the thing is, it, it's because we involve the females because we're rubbish. We usually raise about a thousand, but as soon as you involve the others in, um, suddenly it's like, oh my god, where are we getting all this money from? And we were top of the NHS and leaderboard at one point. Wow, so. gosh. Well, by all means, do send me the link and I'll definitely check it out. I, I got broken foot over the summer, so um, running's right, good excuse. Good a excuse. bit challenging at the minute. But <laughs> no, fair enough. Uh, fair, fair this could be a great rehab, so who knows. But do absolutely send me the link because I'd love to love to at least learn some more. No, no worries. And it's been great to talk to you, so thanks ever so much yeah. for this.